We are a family of faith passionately connecting to Christ, His church, His word, and His mission for His glory. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to Hosea chapter 6. Being gone this week, the uh, title did not make it on the signs out on the street, but the title of this morning's message is The Masquerade of Repentance. The Masquerade of Repentance. We all know what a masquerade party is. It's where you show up and you wear your mask and you dance and party throughout the evening with your mask on, hiding the reality of who you really are. I would say to you that we live in a day where there is a masquerade of repentance. People wearing the mask of repentance, thinking that they are hiding their true nature, when reality, God sees the unrepentance of their hearts. And there are times when we are all guilty. There are some who masquerade as a Christian, but deep down in their hearts, they are really not a Christian. And then there are Christians who are genuinely Christians, who at times masquerade repentance. When the reality is, is that they're harboring unrepentance in their life. So whether you are a true believer masquerading in repentance, or whether or not you're an unbeliever masquerading in repentance, the intent of this sermon is to bring us all to true repentance. We will see that this is exactly the nature of of the nation of Israel. They were masquerading in repentance, but there was no true repentance at all. Hosea chapter 6, we will read all the way through Hosea 7, two chapters. Hosea writes, come, let us return to the Lord for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn, and he will come to us as showers, as the spring rains that, the, that waters the earth. Sounds good. It sounds like they know what true repentance is. But notice God's response. Verse 4. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, I desire the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant, there they dealt faithlessly with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers, tracked with blood, as robbers lie in wait for men. So the priests band together. They murder on the way to Sketchum. They commit villainy in the house of Israel. I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's whoredom is there. Israel is defiled. For you also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed. When I would restore the fortunes of my people... When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed, and the evil deeds of Samaria. For they deal falsely, for, their, for the thief breaks in, and the bandits raid outside. But they do not consider that I remember all the evil. 
know or now their deeds surround them. They are before my face. By their evil, they make the king glad. And the princes, by their treachery, they are all adulterers. They are like a heated oven whose baker ceases to stir the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened. On the day of our king, the princess became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with mockers, for with their hearts like an oven, they approach their intrigue. All night their anger smolders. In the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven, and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength, and he knows it not. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, and he knows it not. The pride of Israel testifies to his face, yet they do not return to the Lord their God nor seek him for all of this. No, they do not seek the Lord. Instead, Ephraim is like a dove, silly without sense, calling to Egypt and going to Assyria. As they go, I will spread over them my net. I will bring them down like birds of the heavens. I will discipline them according to the report made to their congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they well upon their beds. For grain and wine they gash themselves, they rebel against me. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall be or shall fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. It's a warning, isn't it, of the tragic consequences of false repentance. People masquerading themselves around as if they have truly repented of their sin, but yet God knows the difference. We see this truth played out in the nation of Israel. Here they are, going through the motions. However, from God's perspective, they were wrong. From their perspective, they were okay with God. Apparently, they believed that they could placate God by merely going through the motions. I ask you, do we see that in our day? Do we see people who think they can placate God by merely going through the motion? I would say to you that we all are guilty of this. Can I say to you that man's attempt to manipulate God has never worked? Never. Every time man has tried to manipulate God, man has failed miserably and suffered the consequences of trying to play games with God. But God will not be tampered with. God will not be fooled with. God will not be manipulated. As a matter of fact, it is impossible to manipulate God. God has given the nation of Israel clear instructions. God has called them to true repentance. And God has brought forth every means necessary to bring them to repentance. But yet they continue to play games with God. They refuse to turn back to God in sincere worship. So we see their need for true repentance. I would say to you that from this passage... We also see the need of the modern church. Is Israel not a foreshadowing of the church? Do we not see in this passage of scripture the need of the American church to repent and stop masquerading? 
Do we not see the need of the American church to truly repent and stop playing games with God? Thinking that we can manipulate God or placate God? No. Just as the nation of Israel needed to repent, we see the need for true repentance in our own lives as well. Notice the need for repentance in this passage. You see it in verse 1. The author writes, Come, let us return to the Lord. That's a call to repentance. Come, let us return to the Lord. Why? Because he has torn us. God has dealt with them like a moth, if you'll remember. And God has dealt with them like a lion, if you will remember. And God has handed them over to deal with them. He has forsaken them in order to bring them to repentance. God has torn them as an act of mercy and grace in order to bring them to repentance. We see the need to repent because they have been disciplined and torn by God. And God is gracious to do this. It would be ungracious and unmerciful for God to leave us in our sin. But God has brought the shame and the guilt and the consequences of sin upon his people. He has torn them. That's why they need to repent. He goes on to say, he has struck us down. Richard Baxter, the great Puritan, one of the great Puritan pa- uh, pastors said this, there is nothing more that hinders man from repentance than hoping that he can be saved without true repentance. Think about that. There is nothing more that hinders man from true repentance than thinking that he can be saved without true repentance. I would say to you, this is the pandemic of our modern day. People thinking that they can be saved and be right with God without true repentance. Which is foreign to the character of God, the nature of Scripture. It's foreign to the gospel itself. Even Jesus himself said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll perish. It was the message of the apostles throughout the book of Acts, a call to repent and return to God. And so we see the need to repent. There is a need for true repentance in the nation of Israel. And as a result, God rebukes them for their shallow love. Look, they know what true repentance is. Look at what they say. Come, let us return to the Lord. They know True repentance is a return to the Lord. They know the consequences of unrepentance. He has torn us. And what are the blessings of true repentance? That he may heal us. What's the consequence of unrepentance? He has struck us down. What is the blessing of true repentance? He will bind us up. He goes on to say, in two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we might live before him. And they also know that true repentance is a labor. It's a labor. Verse 3, let us know. And then he uses these words, let us press on to know the Lord. It's a labor of love. True repentance is a work. Yes, wrought in us by God, but yet it is a labor. It's not something that just happens easily. We must search our hearts and we must discover why we have sinned against God. And we must look at the temptations in our life and ask ourselves, what were we doing in life situation that calls us to be tempted so as we were, so that we may not fall into that temptation again. It's a labor of abiding in Christ that we might not sin against God. It's a labor in the Word that we might hide God's Word in our heart that we might not sin against God. It's the labor of fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and throwing off the sin and the encumbrances that so easily entangle us. It's the working out of our salvation with fear and trembling that Paul talks about in in Philippians 2, knowing that it is God at work in us. It is the fixing of our eyes of Colossians 3. It's the fixing of our eyes on things above and not on the things of the earth. 
It's the putting on of Christ. It's the laying aside of the old way of life. There is a need for true repentance. It is a labor. It is a pressing on to know the Lord. And they know the blessing of true repentance. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, the showers of blessing, as the spring rains that water the earth. So from their perspective, notice, from their perspective, they are giving God true repentance. But yet from God's perspective, God says, what shall I do with you? You know the character of true repentance. You know the blessing of true repentance. But yet you do not offer God true repentance. You're seeking to placate God with a shallow form of love, which is not love at all. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? It's God's way of saying, nothing I've done has worked. Nothing that I've done to this point has worked. What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud. We know what that is. When you wake up in the morning and there's a dew upon the grass, a dew upon the leaves. But yet when the sun rises, there's no more moisture. The dew is gone. Nothing left. Nothing remained. And God says, that's what the nation of Israel's love like was for him. Your love is like the dew in the early morning. But yet when the sun rises, it's gone. This was God's way of saying, I have done everything for you. I have done everything to bring you to true repentance. And all you offer to me is shallow love. Shallow love, which is not love at all. He says, therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. In other words, I have have sent the prophets to you, but what have you done? You have squandered the grace of God. I have slain you by the words through the mouth of the prophet. I have slain you. I have concealed nothing from you. I've told you the truth. I've called you to repent. And nothing has worked. We see the same need in our day. We see the kindness of God. God continues to remain kind towards them in their unrepentance. He says to them, and we see the kindness of God here in verse 6. He says to them, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. I know that you're going through the acts of worship, but your worship is not sincere. What I, wa- what I wa- want from you is not the masquerade of manipulation. What I want from you is sincere devotion. I've slain you with my words that I might save you. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. I desire the true knowledge of God rather than your burnt offerings. But you're like Adam. When I would have you to be like Christ, you're like Adam. You've transgressed the covenant. You have dealt faithlessly with your God. Gilead, it's a city of evildoers, tracked with blood. They go through the emotions, they go through the motions, yes. But they're robbers who just lie in wait for men. Even their priests band together. The spiritual leaders band together. And lead them into ruin. They murder on the way to sketch them. They commit and commit villainy on their way to worship. On their way to worship God. This is the true nature of their heart. Murder. 
evilness, lies, and wickedness. In the house of Israel, I've seen these horrible things, God says. I've seen Ephraim's whoredom. I've seen that Israel is defiled. And you, Judah, a harvest is appointed for you. I would restore you. I would redeem you, he says. Chapter 7, verse 1. But when I go to restore you, and when I go to redeem you, all I see is what? Your iniquity. Their hearts are hard. Their necks are stiff. And God compares them to three things. God compares them to a heated oven. Look at verse 4. They are all adulterers. They are like a heaven, heated oven. You know what God's saying to them? That you are zealous for your sexual sin. Oh, yes, you have passion, and oh, yes, you have zeal, but you're like a heated oven. Your zeal and your passion is not for the righteousness. You do not hunger and thirst for righteousness. You do not hunger for the glory of God. You hunger for your own sexual pleasures. You're a heated oven. He says it again of them in verse 6 of chapter 7. For with their hearts like an oven they approach their intrigue. All night their anger smolders, and in the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. Their passion is for their sin. Once again, verse 7, all of them are hot as an oven, and they devour their rulers. All their kings have fallen, and none of them calls upon me. Why? Because their passion is for their own flesh. Even though they know what God requires, which is sincere repentance. And they know what true repentance is, but yet they stiffen their neck against the prophets. And the Lord slays them by the word, and they continue thinking that they can manipulate God by placating God, by merely going through the motion. I would say to you, do not get mad at me. I'm simply the messenger. These things come to you for, straight from the word of God. You deal with it. He compares them not only to a heated oven. He also compares them to a cake that's not turned. Verse 8, Ephraim mixes himself with the people. No, no allegiance to God. No undivided devotion. They want God and other gods too. They want God and their sin. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. You can imagine a cake being cooked over the coals. A cake not turned, what does that mean? It means it's burnt on one side, it's uncooked on the other side, and it's doughy in the middle. When God says that they were a heated oven, he was referring to their zeal for sin. And now when he refers to them to a cake not turned, he's saying that because you have zeal for sin, you have become useless. What do you do with a cake that's burnt on one side, uncooked on the other, and mushy in the middle? useless and God says that's what you are because of your unrepentance you're a heated oven and you are a cake that's not turned and then he says furthermore you are a silly dove you have no direction have you ever seen a dove fly before it gets its direction? Before it finds its bearings? A dove will just flop around and chirp. Almost crazy, like they don't know where they're going. Then all of a sudden, 
they get their sense of direction, and then they take off. And he says, you're like a silly dove. You're like a dove that can't find direction. You're foolish. Your zeal is for your own sin. You have become useless, and you are foolish. And because of that, you are like a treacherous bow. Look at verse 16. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. What do we know about a treacherous bow? It's dangerous. They're coming to God and they're saying, look, God, we've repented. And God is saying, no, you're a heated oven. You are zealous for your own sin. You're a cake not turned. You have become useless. You're a silly dove. You have no direction. You're a treacherous bow. You're dangerous and you can't be trusted. What has got them in this condition? A four-letter word. P-R-I-D-E. That's five letters, isn't it? Five-letter word. P-R-I-D-E. Pride. Thomas Brooks, another great Puritan, said, True repentance is a turn from all sin without any reservation or exception. True repentance is a turn from all sin without any reservation or exception. He never truly repented of any sin whose heart is not turned against every sin. Someone has not truly repented unless their heart is turned against every sin. You can't uh, repent of one sin and keep harboring other sins. True repentance is a turning away from all sin. And so we come to our next point. And in this passage, we see the need for repentance, but we also see the manner of true repentance. What is the manner of true repentance? Well, go back to chapter 6, verse 1. Here's the manner of true repentance. It is, it is to turn. Come, let us return to the Lord, he says. That's what true repentance is. It's a returning to God. It is a turning away from sin, a forsaking of sin, a hatred for sin, and a full return to God. I would say to you that true repentance, first of all, is a sense of departure from God. In order to return to God, you first must realize that you have departed from God. True repentance, first, is a sense that you have departed from God. I have no doubt that there are some false converts in here today, people who have truly never been saved, and the first thing that you must recognize is that you have departed from God. And then for every Christian that is in here today who is harboring some type of stronghold in your life, you must first realize that your stronghold is a departure from God. Secondly, true repentance involves an acknowledgement of just of God's just chastisement. They acknowledged that. They acknowledged that they had departed from God. Come, let us return to the Lord. And then notice, they acknowledged the just chastisement of God. He has torn us. He has struck us down. True repentance involves an acknowledgement of departure from God. And secondly, an acknowledgement that God's justice is just. And because of my sin, I deserve every ounce of the wrath of God to be poured out upon my life. Thirdly, true repentance is the determination. Listen, it is a determination to return to God. Where do we see that? Verse 3. Let us know. Let us 
press on. That's a determination word. And let us press on. What? To know the Lord. I've discovered in my 23 years of pastoral ministry and in my 23 years of salvation that this is true. Many of us pray for repentance and we wait, we wait on God to zap us. Lord, bless me with repentance. And then we keep living our same old life hoping that somehow God will just zap us and everything will change. Yes, we pray for repentance and we realize that repentance is a gift of God, but it's something that we labor to achieve. It's something that we press on to pursue. That's why I've said to you many, many times that yes, we are Christians, but at the same time we are repentors. We are to constantly be repenting of sin. So it's a determination to return to God. And true repentance, number four, desires others also to return to God. If I've truly repented, then I want to see others truly repent. So we see the manner of true repentance. Then we ask ourselves the question, then why do men and women, why do they not repent? Because they've grown accustomed to sin. It's just a part of who they are. They continue in sin because they believe that they've escaped unpunishment here, so they'll escape unpunishment there. They haven't been punished yet. So they assume that they won't be punished later. So they continue in sin. Also, they only ever think of the mercy of God. That's all they ever think about is the mercy of God. God is so merciful. And he is, but they never contemplate the justice of God and the wrath of God and the righteousness of God. They hold to God's promises, but they don't hold to the promise when God says, you will perish if you do not repent. That's a promise as well. And that lastly, they do not see the vileness of their own sin. People who do not repent of sin trample underfoot the grace of God, and they they don't see the vileness of their own sin. Let me say to you, as we begin to close up, what is the result of true repentance? Or what are the results of true repentance? Go back to chapter 6. Healing is the result of true repentance. He has torn us that he may heal us. Revival is the result of true repentance. He has struck us down and he will bind us up. And in two days he will what? Revive us. Blessing is the result of true repentance. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Fourth, redemption is the result of true repentance. Look at verse 13 of chapter 7. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, For they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. The result of true repentance, healing, revival, blessing, and redemption. You could say it this way. In this passage, we see three things. We see God's nature, which is holy. We see man's nature, which is sinful. 
and we see sin's nature, which is deceptive. Thomas Brooks said, through true repentance, or though, he says this, though true repentance never be late, yet late repentance is seldom true. True repentance is never late. Yet late repentance is seldom true. Oh, I'll repent later. I'm just not ready yet. You know, before I die, I, I'll, I'll get right with the Lord. Thomas Brooks. True repentance is never late. It's immediate. Whereas late repentance is seldom true. He goes on to say, concerning the thief on the cross, I offer these things briefly to your thoughts. That as one was saved to teach sinners not to despair, so the other was damned to teach them not to be late. A pardon is sometimes given to one on the gallows, but the whole, but but who, uh, but whose trust, but he who trusts in that rope may be his downfall. So, what is the example of Scripture? Immediate repentance, not late repentance. Some would say, well, the thief on the cross had late repentance and he was saved. Yes, it's an encouragement not to despair. If on your deathbed you call out to Christ. But the other side of that is the other was damned to hell. So it's better to give the Lord immediate repentance rather than trusting in late repentance. So I say to us this morning, have you been wearing a mask? Have you been masquerading around as a repentant person, but behind the mask you are unrepentant? Then hear the call to true repentance today. I asked the Lord this morning, I said, Lord, would you bless this service with a spirit and an, and an anointing of genuine repentance? What that means is, Lord, is, Lord, that anybody who desires true repentance today, would you grant it to them, Lord? Would you grant it to them? I believe that prayer is in line with the will of God. So I believe that today that there is a spirit of repentance, an anointing of repentance that God has placed on this service for all those who are willing to repent. Some of you this morning need to repent unto genuine salvation. You this morning, you need to, know, to acknowledge that you have departed from God. You need to acknowledge that God is just in his chastisement of you. You need to come to the Lord. You need to de be determined to return to God. And also desires others to return to God. So is that you this morning? I've sinned. I've departed from God. And God is just to throw me into the deepest recesses of hell. But I come today claiming the name of Jesus and determined to live my life by the power of God in true repentance. And I pray for a desire to see others repent as well. If that's you here in a moment, I'm going to pray. And if that's you, you come. For those of you who need to be saved, you come. You come. And for those in here today who are saved, has your repentance been thorough? When's the last time you've allowed the Lord just to examine your heart and reveal to you? Have you repented of some sins, been hanging on to other sins?
but yet God has shown you this morning that true repentance is turning from all sin, would you come today and let us experience this healing, this revival, this restoration, this rising up, this blessing that God offers? Father God, we commit this time to you today. We take our mask off because you see us behind the mask anyway. And Lord, we come to you. We come to you in true repentance. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand and come now as the Lord leads you come. Hey, we want to say thank you for checking us out on YouTube. Thank you for listening to the sermon. And if you have any questions about the content of that sermon or even about salvation, uh, please contact us on the website that's listed there on the screen. We would love to hear from you, also be able to speak with you, and perhaps even answer any questions that you may have. God bless. Keep tuning in.